In this video, we'll be discussing the overall paradigm of the TNG era uniforms, as conceived and established by William Ware Tice. With today's relatively wide cultural awareness of TNG, decades after its original televised run, countless reruns and releases, and several spin offs later, I think there's a lot that we might now take for granted about these uniforms and their successors that at the time required very calculated and intentional decisions. This isn't an examination of any one specific uniform, but more about why things were the way they were conceptually, the ideology behind the TNG era uniforms. And from my outsider's perspective, what I believe may have been going on in the minds of Gene Roddenberry and William Wertice at the time. About 20 years before The Next Generation, William Ware Tice was the costume designer on the original series and the aborted Phase 2. From the precious little we've seen of Phase 2, it seems clear that moving forward, Tice had intended to stick pretty closely to the original uniforms and wardrobe paradigm he'd established in the original series. Between Phase 2's abandonment and The Next Generation's launch, however, there had been four movies starring the original cast, for which Robert Fletcher was the costume designer and Gene Roddenberry had had limited involvement. The conception and rocky initial production of TNG has been well documented, which you can learn about on the TNG Blu-ray special features and William Shatner's Chaos on the Bridge, among other sources. The gist of it is that Gene Roddenberry is said to have been unhappy with certain aspects of the movies, and his lack of creative involvement with them, and he'd become notoriously protective of his vision of the future. Being back at the helm for the spin-off series, obsessed with what he believed Star Trek was and wasn't, and with more creative control, it should come as no surprise that he'd want to round up as much of the original team as possible, including William R. Tice. For this new series, there would again be new Starfleet uniforms, and Tice's overall approach seems to have basically been to pick up where he left off with the original series in Phase 2, almost entirely disregarding Robert Fletcher's work on the movies. We'll look at some of Fletcher's costumes shortly, as well as some movie-era design elements Tice decided to either discard or incorporate into his TNG-era uniforms. I'll also discuss why I believe Tice chose the approach he did. The Starfleet uniform paradigm Tice established in the original series included three division colors. For the movies, Robert Fletcher considerably widened the palette of division colors and changed their associations. But for the next generation, Tice disregarded Fletcher's division colors and instead returned to his original three colors, albeit with the red and gold divisions swapped. The TOS uniforms underwent considerable evolution over the show, but in all their incarnations, Tice had established the crew wearing a Starfleet emblem on the left chest. Robert Fletcher had adapted and modified this design element for the movie-era uniforms, and Tice incorporated this idea into his TNG-era uniforms as well. In the original series, Tice had also established several Starfleet uniform variants for specific crew members and occasions. For example, the captain would have the option of wearing a more relaxed, semi-casual uniform that was distinctive from everyone else's standard duty uniform. Although Tice himself never explored this possibility with his initial TNG era uniforms, costume designer Robert Blackman would later follow up on this idea. Tice also established that the ship's doctor, or doctors, would have an optional uniform variant. In The Next Generation, Tice gave Dr. Crusher an optional lab coat to complement her standard duty uniform, and his immediate successor, Dorinda Rice Wood, dressed Dr. Pulaski in her own series of medical smock variants. The original series also had the crew wearing formal uniforms for special occasions, and Tice incorporated this concept into his TNG-era paradigm as well. Another of Tice's wardrobe choices was to often have background extras and worker bees dressed in coveralls rather than the standard duty uniforms. He integrated this idea into his TNG-era wardrobe, too. Although Robert Fletcher created outstanding uniforms for the movies, several of which would go on to become fan favorites, like the Monster Maroons, in doing so, he had largely disregarded William Ware Tice's work on the original series. In addition to the color palette, one of the major ways Fletcher diverged from Tice's original series paradigm was by significantly expanding the Starfleet uniform family to include more classes and variants. 
This wider variety of uniform styles added more depth to the Star Trek universe, as well as more visual interest, something arguably needed after the bland and muted uniform colors from the motion picture. One major uniform distinction Fletcher made was between commissioned officers and enlisted crew. This was something we hadn't seen in the original series, and the actual existence of enlisted crew members was a departure from the show. Until I'd taken a closer look at the TOS era uniforms, as a casual viewer, my personal interpretation was that officers wore the standard duty uniforms and enlisted crew wore the aforementioned coveralls. But Captain John Chase of Starfleet.ca addressed the issue in an excellent blog post, which I'll link to below if you're interested. But basically, he explained why this wasn't true and set us all straight on the issue. Coveralls notwithstanding, in Tysis Paradigm, you were either in Starfleet and wore the uniform, or you weren't. It was pretty simple. Despite the existence of enlisted Starfleet personnel having been firmly established and enlisted crew having visually distinctive uniforms in the movies, Tykes returned to his original paradigm of you either wear the uniform or you don't for the next generation. Fletcher also dressed engineering crew in heavy protective suits, visually implying how powerful and hazardous Starfleet engines could be, how committed Starfleet was to the safety of its crew, and just how intense it could be to work next to a matter antimatter reactor that powered a starship. Tice disregarded the protective engineering suits for TNG as well. Engineers simply wore the standard duty uniforms. Hell, crew members regularly wore the scants within a stone's throw of the warp core, so maybe we can surmise that Starfleet had made some great strides forward with engineering workplace safety over the Lost Era. Nor would Tice ever dress a TNG-era engineer in a vest like the one Fletcher designed for Scotty. For the movie-era uniforms, Fletcher also gave medical personnel a specific uniform style that bore little resemblance to the standard duty uniforms, and which seemed to be less of a variant and more of a class. Although Tice had established possible medical variants for medical personnel in the original series, his medical uniform variants were stylistically much closer to the standard duty uniforms. Again though, Tice returned to his tighter uniform paradigm for TNG. Other than Dr. Crusher's distinctive lab coat, medical personnel just wore the standard Starfleet uniforms. Fletcher gave the movie-era Starfleet security helmets and armor, which, again, Tice discarded. I'm sure all the countless gold shirts over the years appreciated that. TNG-era security officers marched right into God knows what, with naught but a phaser and the spandex jumpsuits on their backs. In the movies, we also saw the crew members don various styles of field uniforms, including both jackets and vests. Even though Tice himself had designed landing party jackets in the original TOS pilot, The Cage, he didn't pursue the concept for TNG. Characters would just go on away missions in the standard uniform. The most they'd ever bother to do would be to grab a tricorder and or phaser, just like in the original series including some situations in which it would have been really handy to have some field supplies like food, water, first aid, basic tools, and other emergency supplies. And finally, Fletcher had introduced another semi-casual uniform option in the form of a 23rd century bomber jacket. Obviously, Tice chose to discard that idea as well. I mean, I don't really see this guy wearing a bomber jacket over his scant, do you? So why did Tice so thoroughly discard Fletcher's work for the next generation? Well, we can only speculate. Personally, I believe there may have been several major factors. First may be the purely practical issues of television versus movie budgets and television versus movie needs. Movies have larger budgets, which allow for more elaborate costumes, and more of them. There are more extras, all of whom need to be costumed. With more characters over a longer span of time on a giant theater screen, more visual interest is arguably needed. But the costumes still have to bear scrutiny since they'll be seen on such a huge screen. On the other hand, one could argue that, at least in an era long before DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming, TV costumes should be fairly homogenous and instantly recognizable so the viewer and or channel surfer immediately knows what show is on. And at the time TNG originally aired, the costumes only needed to withstand the scrutiny of real-time VHS quality on an 80s-era TV. Not that Tice or his successors ever phoned it in. It's actually amazing just how well the TOS and TNG-era costumes hold up in remastered HD. 
And from what little we saw and what we left behind, DS9's costumes looked phenomenal in Remastered HD. But today's 4K binge-watching is an entirely different production and viewing experience, and the TNG uniforms didn't need to be as ornate and intricately detailed as Fletcher's movie-era uniforms. Even if Roddenberry and or Tice wanted to, which I doubt, having an entire TV series worth of Fletcher's uniforms may have been utterly impractical for budgetary reasons. Second, Gene Roddenberry is said to have been displeased with the apparent militarization of Starfleet in the movies, which was reflected in the movie-era uniforms. I believe one reason the TNG-era uniforms were so different from their movie-era predecessors was an attempt by Roddenberry to visually distance, or even disassociate, the next generation from the TOS movies as far as possible. And third, it's my personal belief that Tice may have felt slighted by Fletcher's radically different uniform designs, and after Phase 2 never made it off the ground, the success of the movies was just salt in his wound. After all, how would you feel if you were the original costume designer, your show was cancelled, but then became enormously popular afterward, and your uniform designs became iconic? You were to be the costume designer on the new show, which was abandoned, the cast went on to do four movies without you, but with another costume designer who had largely disregarded your now-iconic work, and those movies were well-received and successful, and the original producer, for whom the movies were also a sore spot, invited you back to design costumes for the new spin-off series. I know how I'd feel. Artistic and budgetary differences aside, I believe these circumstances may have been a driving force in the mind of William R. Tice when conceptualizing his TNG-era uniforms. In a nutshell, I believe Roddenberry's apparent obsession with recapturing the essence of Star Trek, Tice's own design style being so different from Fletcher's and his subsequent, possibly bitter experience about the movies, and the simple budgetary limitations all shaped the decision-making process for TNG's costume design. Although William Ware Tice almost entirely disregarded Robert Fletcher's movie-era paradigm in costume designs, there were a few elements of Fletcher's work that he kept and incorporated into The Next Generation. One tenet of the underlying philosophy for the TNG-era uniforms seems to have been a better representation of gender equality than had been presented in the original series. While progressive for its time, TOS showed us that women didn't wear pants, told us women weren't allowed to be starship captains, and generally had what today might be regarded as sexist overtones. Despite being a flawed product of its time, I think most fans would probably agree that, at its best, Star Trek has always presented, or at least tried to present, an optimistic future for humanity, free of racism, sexism, and bigotry of any kind, populated by people who respect each other, work for the common good of everyone, and accomplish great things together. At its heart, Star Trek tried to show us a future in which all humans can simply get along without our current and historical preconceptions and biases against each other, inhibiting us from reaching our full potential. The issue of gender equality manifested in Roddenberry's conceptions of the next generation. Rather than populating the show with shallow women obsessed over physical beauty and mindlessly swooning over men, and dismissing ideas like women not being allowed to be starship captains, he created three female lead characters, all of whom were senior officers and two of them department chiefs. This more evolved stance on gender equality also seems to have informed William R. Tice's costume designs for the new Starfleet uniforms. Rather than male Starfleet crew wearing full-body uniforms with tunic and trousers, and the ladies wearing mini-dresses, it was apparently decided that both genders should have the same uniforms and alternative wearing options. Tice may have already been moving in this direction with the aborted Phase 2. It seems that by that time, female crew were finally permitted to wear pants with their Starfleet uniforms, as evidenced by these uniform trousers, presumably for the character of Janice Rand. I believe this might have been the first notable shift in the gender psychology of Tice's Starfleet uniform design. Women wearing pants to work might be a laughable given today, but at the time, this could be considered a significant step, however small, toward gender equality. Despite the Phase 2 uniforms having never made it on screen, in-universe, and Tice's lack of involvement with the movies, Robert Fletcher's uniform designs were generally unisex. 
And furthermore, this mentality may have influenced Roddenberry and or Tice to create the now infamous unisex TNG scant uniforms, but more on those shortly. Unfortunately, the Starfleet insignia situation, as seen in the original series, was kind of a mess. One could easily be forgiven for assuming that the triangular arrowhead emblem we now associate with Starfleet was unique to the Enterprise crew, and the wide variety of assignment patches seemed to indicate unique insignia for each ship, base, institute, etc. There appears to have even been confusion among the production team as to the original intent, as evidenced by this memo from producer Robert Justman to William R. Tice. In the motion picture, a circle was added behind the previous Enterprise emblem, and the patch color indicated the wearer's division. The motion picture also introduced the notion of the Starfleet emblem being a separate metal, or metal-looking, pin attached to the garment. Although the design of the emblem was modified again, it was standardized for all Starfleet uniforms in the Wrath of Khan, and the notion of the chest badge being a separate metal pin, as opposed to a sew-on patch, was fully realized across the cast. After Fletcher's standardization of the chest badge, and with a second chance at independently establishing consistency in the new show, it should be no surprise that Tice incorporated a standardized metal Starfleet insignia onto his TNG era uniforms. For the movie era uniforms, Fletcher placed the wearer's rank on the upper right shoulder strap. Although for the original series uniforms, Tice had previously established the wearer's rank with braid on the sleeves, for the next generation he switched to metal rank insignia and also positioned it on the upper right area of the uniform. In the motion picture, Fletcher introduced a Starfleet uniform that was a skin-tight jumbo spandex jumpsuit. Gene Roddenberry is said to have both favored the sprayed-on clothing aesthetic and abhorred wrinkly costumes, and Tice favored unstructured garments made with synthetic knit fabrics, so either one or both of them seem to have really latched onto this uniform concept. The standard T&G era uniforms were also skin-tight jumpsuits made of heavy jumbo spandex, although thankfully with the more modest areas blacked out. Tice's original Klingon costumes had usually included a baldric, which he gave to Worf. Some believe it may have even been the same one. However, the Klingons had been given significant makeup and costume redesigns in the movies. It was decided to maintain their movie-era look, including Fletcher's Klingon costumes. I think this was a great call. Reverting back to the TOS-era Klingon costumes and makeup would have been jarring and off-putting after what we'd seen in three of the four movies at that point. And in fact, Fletcher's Klingon costumes would continue to be used throughout The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, amassing far more screen time over their numerous television appearances than the movies he originally designed them for. Now that we've discussed the overall paradigm and possible psychological factors behind Tice's TNG-era costume designs, in this final section, we'll take a look at some more specific ideas and influences that may have played a part in the conception of the show's wardrobe. For the third season of the original series, Tice changed the standard uniforms to a double-knit fabric. The previous woven uniforms had proven problematic due to shrinkage over time, and some members of the cast struggled with their weight, causing additional fitting issues. This may have intensified Tice's aversion to structured uniforms and woven fabrics, and switching to the double knit seems to have solved, or at least reduced, these issues. I mention it as possible evidence that Tice was already moving toward knit fabrics for his Starfleet uniforms. Hence, all of his TNG era uniforms being made with nylon jumbo spandex. Tice had a singular style, and he seems to have revisited several of his design motifs from the original series. He definitely seems to have enjoyed experimenting with asymmetry, which strongly manifested in his TNG era uniforms. Speaking of his Admiral uniform designs, in the original series, he'd consistently established that flag officers wore a distinctive metal accent on their uniforms. His TNG-era Admiral uniform would likewise include a unique metal brooch. The TOS-era tunic necklines varied considerably, but by Season 3, Tice definitely seems to have favored the V-shaped neckline. His TNG-era uniforms would have similarly wide, V-shaped necklines, albeit without the collar. 
A subtle design motif that Tice favored right from the beginning with the cage and where no man has gone before was small openings, which I call slits, at the ends of garment limbs. He used this motif on other costumes as well, including these two asymmetrically paneled jumpsuits. He incorporated a pleated variation of these slits on the bottom of his Phase 2 uniform trousers, and he would return to this idea for his TNG era uniforms as well. Again on the topic of gender equality, in the original series the standard uniform for female crew members had been the mini dress, also called a scant, most notably worn by Lt. Uhura, but also Janice Rand and other prominent guest stars. I already mentioned how Fletcher's movie era uniforms were essentially unisex, and how Tice may have already been moving in that direction with his Phase 2 costume designs. Well, the next generation took things a step further by demonstrating that in the future, not only was it acceptable for women to wear the same uniforms the men wore, but that men could wear the same ones women wore. Whether or not this was a good idea, or a successful attempt to portray true gender equality, is a matter of personal opinion. Some may attribute the overall semblance of Tice's TNG era formal uniforms as a subtle nod to Fletcher's movie era uniforms, for obvious reasons. However, I find it far more likely that Tice was revisiting his costume design for Ambassador Robert Fox. And finally, in the original series, Tice established the look of the Romulan uniforms, grayish textured fabrics with dark belts and contrasting sashes over the right shoulder. And in his final episode as costume designer, he followed up on his original design when introducing the TNG era Romulans. William Ware Tice so thoroughly established a paradigm and aesthetic with his TNG era uniforms that not only would his costume designs set the precedent for the following spin-offs, but decades later his TNG era uniforms are still instantly recognizable to almost anyone with even a modicum of nerdum and or pop culture awareness. His TNG era uniform designs were a direct evolution of those he designed for the original series, and, as we saw with the trousers, the aborted Phase 2. They were perhaps a culmination of assorted design motifs he'd introduced and experimented with on the original show, then revisited when conceptualizing what the Star Trek universe might look like a hundred years or so after his 23rd century uniforms. Tice had already begun favoring knit fabrics for Starfleet uniforms in the original series, and may have been moving toward more unisex uniforms for Phase 2. It's pretty obvious that Robert Fletcher and William Ware Tice, while both gifted costume designers who made great contributions to Star Trek, had radically different, practically incompatible artistic visions for the future. For any combination of the reasons I mentioned earlier, or for other reasons entirely, Tice established a uniform paradigm for the next generation that, while unique and even striking, was an obvious follow-up to his work on the original series. While some of his more niche ideas, like men wearing scants in his Season 1 Admiral uniform, would be short-lived, other facets of his paradigm, such as the three division colors and upper right rank placement, would continue to be seen all the way through Enterprise. Although Tice himself was only directly involved with the costumes for a single season, and the design of the uniforms would evolve after his departure, the paradigm and look of the next generation would become, in my opinion, every bit as iconic as his uniforms for the original series. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. And if you're able, please support my costume research on coffee. This helps me be able to produce more sewing and costuming resources like this one. These take a lot of time to put together, but I'm happy to do it and I really appreciate everyone's support so far. I have a long list of more videos like this and topics I'd like to delve into, so again, if you enjoy this kind of thing, please drop by coffee.com slash obsessive costuming dude. If you can swing it, a monthly subscription of any amount goes a long way, but if not, every little bit helps. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and see you again soon.